Good evening. My name is Olivia Dorsey, and I'm a trustee of the Kansas City Public Library. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Our speaker, Jamar Joseph, is an associate professor at Columbia School of Arts in the film department. Um, he has written and directed um, for Black Stars, HBO, Fox TV, New Line Cinema, Warner Brothers, and A&E. He's produced screenplays that include Ali, an American Hero, New York Undercover for Fox, Knights of the South Bronx for A&E, The Many Trials of Tammy B from Nickelodeon. He wrote and directed Drive By, A Love Story, Da Zone, and the docudrama Hughes Dreams Harlem for Black Stars. He recently finished his screenplay, Panther Baby, for Focus Features, which he will also direct based on his own true life experience, and that's the reason that brought you here for the book. I want to mention right now that uh, Jamal Joseph's book, Panther Baby, is on sale and out in the foyer, and he will be signing books after the uh, presentation this, this morning, this evening. This is a fabulous book. If you haven't read it, you should. You should read it for a number of reasons. One, it is a wonderful picture of an African American's life in the time of the Panther Party, but there's not very often that you get a story, a true story about an African American male's life and an autobiography in that. I asked for the pleasure of introducing Jamal Joseph because we have a bit of history together. Um, I met jo Jamal in a, on a piece of notebook paper, a yellow notepad that was sent to me at my job. Some of you know I still work at KMBC TV and at the time I did a, a Sunday morning half hour show called Dimensions in Black. And Jamal sent me a letter. The letter had a poem in it. And from the poem itself, I could tell this was a brilliant person. And when I opened the envelope and recognized the fact that this, was, this letter was from a man incarcerated at Leavenworth Penitentiary, it gave me a bit of a pause. But the letter also included an invitation to come and meet with the Brothers Association that was at Leavenworth at the time. I decided to go, met Jamal. We became good friends. His, um, I think I probably came to Leavenworth a couple of times, more than once, to speak and communicate with other African American men who were incarcerated at Leavenworth. What was so amazing to me that Jamar, as I said, Jamal, as I said, was very brilliant, but just all of you in this room know how many other African American men who are incarcerated, who are not living their potential because they are incarcerated. So it was immediately striking to me that he was living his potential incarcerated by working on two degrees and completing them while there. But I also remember um, Jamal's wife contacting me and telling me that she had decided to move from New York City, her home, with their young son and spend the last year of Jamal's incarceration um, in Leavenworth so that they could be supportive and help him transition back into life outside. And that always amazed me and touched me and um, we've kind of lost contact. The last, the, the time that I then saw Jamal after visiting him and his family in New York was watching the Emmys and seeing this man being nominated for an Emmy. I was amazed but not shocked because this man is brilliant and you will hear his brilliance and hear about his life story this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Jamal Joseph. At the risk of sounding ridiculous, let me say that revolutionaries are guided by great feelings of love. 
That quote is actually from Ernesto Che Guevara given uh, at a speech that he gave at the United Nations in 1959. And it's one of the first things I saw when I walked into the Black Panther office in New York, in Brooklyn, New York in 1968. And it didn't make a lot of sense to me on that day, but it would soon come to make a lot of sense. And it would soon come to make a lot of sense not only in terms of what the movement was about and what the Black Panther Party was about, but what our continuum as a people struggling for liberation was about. This idea of being guided by great feelings of love. This idea of being guided by a love of self, a love for humanity. This idea of having a love that would help preserve a people through one of the most terrible times in not only African history, but in human history, slavery, that great dark 450 year period where people were torn from their homes, torn for their lives and put into bondage. And one of the great features of that bondage was keeping a people in ignorance. And that idea that you could not talk about your history, you could not talk about your land or your culture, you certainly could not read. And so whenever I get a chance to talk and it's in a place like the library and in a wonderful library like this, I like to start with this idea of love, but also start with this idea of knowledge and being able to read as something that's so fundamental and so dear and so important. It wasn't so long ago in terms of American history that this very gathering would have been illegal. That the idea is that we would be in a place that had books. We have words on paper, words bound to inspire ideas and thoughts and informations and questions could be shared freely among people from all different backgrounds as representative of the audience here tonight. That the people of African descent, African American, African Latino, anybody from the diaspora who's in this room would have been beaten, would have been tortured, might have been dismembered, might have been imprisoned, might have been killed for being in a place where they had books. And that people here who are uh, white would have been fined, possibly beaten, and put into prison for facilitating this kind of knowledge insurrection. When I joined the Black Panther Party in 1968, America was in a very challenging place. We were dealing with the fact that there was unemployment, that there was police brutality, that people were being uh, shot down in the street by police officers, that there was poverty, that there was uh, substandard health care, uh, that there was a lack of education and failing schools. Excuse me, did I say 1968 or 2012? <clears throat> I was a young man who didn't know his real father. I came to find out later who he was. I was a young man who was raised by his grandparents, as is true uh, in our community many, many times, loving, wonderful, adopted grandparents who themselves had been the sons and the daughters of slaves. And so I heard these stories about America at that terrible time. I heard these stories about a time period when you couldn't get an education where you couldn't vote, where people were lynched in their communities, where aunts and uncles had been lynched and raped, where you walked down a sidewalk and you could not, if you were a person of color, look a white person in the eye. Where you could not, if you were a person of color, claim any kind of right of way on that sidewalk. If a white person was coming down the sidewalk, you had to get off and get into the street. And it didn't matter if the person that was coming down the street uh, was a young white person, healthy 15-year-old, 16-year-old young white man, and the person coming the other way was your grandmother, our grandmother, anyone's grandmother, who was 80 and whose bones were aching, who could barely get down the street when she came face to face with that 15-year-old white teenager. And if it was raining, grandma had to get off the street and step into the mud. I heard these stories growing up. I heard about the NAACP, which I was 
active in through my grandparents. I, I heard about the Back to Africa movement founded by Marcus Mosiah Garvey because they had been part of that movement. I heard about this thing called love in Trinity Baptist Church and Union Baptist Church because Grandma Nooney was a missionary. And so all of that was wrapped in together. And I, I heard about the fact that we were Africans from Grandpa, but in very rich, vibrant ways. In fact, uh, Grandpa uh, would be watching television, and we'd be sitting in the living room watching the old black and white TV, and there would be a Tarzan movie playing. I'd be doing my homework. I was about 11 or 12 years old. And uh, Johnny Weissmiller would swing across the screen, and he would do his Tarzan yell. and and he would jump down, and whatever was going on, he would uh, talk his Tarzan talk, and the elephants would move one way, and the lions would move one way, and the tigers would move one way, and the Africans would be off to the side, scared to death and trembling. And Grandpa would look at that for a few minutes, and he would look, and he would rub his chin, and he would go, now what the F is that? <laughs> no, tell me, boy, what the F is that? Tell me how in the hell this little cracker baby can fall out the damn plane. He can speak lie and monkey tire, every damn thing. The Africans look like they're crazy. Change the damn channel. <laughs> that was my critique on, early critique on media. He was a media critic. <laughs> and it was a lesson in media and African history and racism and all of that rolled into one. Uh, he was my critique on the news. I would change the channel and there would be a reporter. I remember the first time seeing a reporter, his name was Harry Reasoner. I remember his reasoner like he's a reasonable guy. <laughs> he was a young man. He was giving an editorial. He was talking about the early days of the space program. There was the race for space uh, that was going on with the, uh, with the Russians. And uh, 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 Mr. Reasoner was giving uh, his opinion in this editorial. Uh, remember, we had just turned from Tarzan. And Grandpa kind of sat back and he looked at Mr. Reason and he let him speak for about three or four minutes. And he gave his editorial about the editorial, which was, you was a lion, onion head, frying pan face, MF and cracker boy, change the damn channel. <laughs> that was my early critique on media and because Grandpa questioned, I knew somehow to question, maybe I didn't know how to question, but I sure knew how to cuss in the schoolyard from being around Grandpa. He was a fiery man, but he was also what we call a race man. And at a time when it was embarrassing to use the name African in anything but a ne negative way, he let me know we were an African people. At a time when we were still having the debate if we were Negro or colored, maybe black, he let me know that we are a black people. And it was a time when we, we used it as an insult. You would go to school. Some of the people who were older in the audience remember that we'd, we'd use it as a school. People would play the dozens. It would be, and it would be the yo mama jokes, the ones that would make you fight. Your mama's so black. You know that one. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Your mama's so black she could be in night school and be marked absent. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago they had that hit on the radio. If you're white, you're just right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, what? Get back. Well, it was history, but it was living history. Vibrant history is what we call griot history. You know, when you're getting the oral tradition mixed in with what was going on. It was the kind of history that made grandma come and sit me down when I was a young boy, showing me pictures that I just didn't quite understand, but things that she thought that I needed to see. She would save that spread that was in Ebony Magazine that had a picture of Emmett Till after he had left from Chicago and gone down to Mississippi to spend a summer vacation in the country, where he could get some fresh air and learn what hard work really was and swim in the lake and do all of those things that his mother had done when she was young, in the safety of relatives in the South. And Matil made the mistake one day of, after a hard day's work, of when they were in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the store of me, of whistling at the woman who was behind the counter, the young white woman. And we know how that story terribly ends. It was a day or two later that the woman's husband and a friend and some other people came and dragged Emmett from his bed while his grandfather begged for his life. And they said, we're just going to teach the boy a lesson. And the lesson that they taught young, young Emmett too was to kill him, to beat him, to choke him, to shoot him, to mutilate him 
and to throw his body in the river. When Amy Till came down from Chicago and saw her son, she tells the story of having to start from his feet and work her way up his body so that she could take in what was done. And she saw that she was swollen and that he was beaten and he was mutilated and that he was swollen. And she talks about finally getting to his head and seeing where the bullet hole was and that the bullet hole was so large that she could see sunlight coming in from the other side. Imagine her pain. Imagine her horror and her fear. But she did one of the bravest things that was ever done in the history of our struggle. When they said, Ms. Till will fix him up real good and will close the coffin so nobody has to see, and she said, no, you won't. I want this coffin to remain open so that the world can see what was done to my son. And not just in a way of selfishly warning people to see the horror and the brutality, but so that the world could maybe extract from this a lesson, extract from this a warning, extract from this a call to action. And in the city of Chicago, 50,000 people came to see the body of Emmett Till. And those pictures became something that reverberated throughout the community. And I, in New York, a couple of years later, as a young boy that didn't quite understand, sat with my grandmother when she'd opened a special album. She had an album of family photos, but it was a special album of things that I should know. And Marcus Garvey was in there, and Sojourner Truth was in there, and Harriet Tubman was in there. And yes, the photos of Emmett Till were in there because I should know my place as a young black man in this society. What would happen to me if I didn't quite keep my place? Grandpa passed away and I kind of looked for manhood even though I was an honor student and in the choir and in some organizations in the community, wherever I could find it. And for a lot of us, that's the street corner. That's the basketball court. That's with the slightly older guys because you want to look and see how, how they stand and how they walk and how they talk and how they dribble the basketball and how they talk to girls. You want to see what you have to do as you're walking down that path to manhood. And then one dark night in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and I was angry. I was angry because I looked up to him, because I loved him. I was angry because he was a Prince of Peace. I was angry because I had some sense of it from being a member of the NAACP Youth Council. And so I went down to 125th Street where they were rioting and I got caught up in the fever and the collective anger of our people as people were rioting. I threw a couple of bricks. I had cops chase me. They fired shots at me and then I was protected by this group of men that I didn't quite understand who stood between the cops and myself and stood them down and told me, young brother, go home tonight. This is not a place to be tonight. And I remember saying, I'm gonna be a black militant. Didn't quite understand what the words meant, but I knew that I had seen people like H. Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael on television. I remember coming to school the very next day and sitting at the lunch table with my friends, announcing to my friends, Dr. Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed by Whitey. Whitey killed the king, and I'm gonna be a black militant. And my friends, and we had a little group out, we were hallway monitors, and, and one of my good friends was a white kid, a Jewish kid named Paul Kirshner. And I remember Paul looking at me saying, Eddie, I don't know if you can announce you're gonna be a black militant like it's a career choice. <laughs> like you're gonna be a doctor or a lawyer. And I said, no, Paul, you watch, you just don't get it. I'm gonna be a black militant. And as much to prove to Paul as to my declaration, I had to find the most militant organization on the scene. Remember, this was all completely subjective at the time. The black Muslims. I was like, nah, I don't really like bow ties. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, grandma makes that bacon and pancakes on Sunday morning. <laughs> it was that quick. I didn't really investigate what was going on. <laughs> SNCC. No, Paul and all those guys were too SNCC, snot, snake, I'm not going to. And then I was watching television and the Black Panthers, there was a news story about the Black Panther Party. And the Panthers stormed the state capital of Sacramento with guns. Now the Panthers started in Oakland, California. 
and they would patrol the streets with shotguns and law books. At the time, it was legal to carry a rifle or a shotgun in the state of California if you didn't have a criminal record. Anyone could buy one and anyone could carry it. And the Panthers began to patrol the police because police brutality in California was particularly out of control. Um, the same was true in Harlem, in Chicago. When you would get arrested, the cops would smack you around. It would be standard operational procedure. I remember getting smacked around by cops when I was little for just sneaking into the park and the cops came and smacked us around and kicked us, you know, kicked us in the butt and hit us with nightclubs, you know, around our butt saying, you stay out the park, get your damn asses home. And I remember running with my little friends and one of my friends was lingering behind and he was crying. And we got around the corner and we caught our breath and we looked at him and we teased him for crying. He had been brutalized by the cops. We had been brutalized by the cops, but there was nothing in our consciousness that had let us know that grown men had brutalized little children, that men who had taken an oath to protect the law had broken the law, that we had been victims of racism and police brutality. And a few years later, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale began to articulate that pain, that rage, that injustice, very simply by exercising their constitutional right for self-defense. They patrolled the streets of Oakland, California with shotguns and with law books and would stand the legal distance of 15 feet away and read the, the statutes to the police officers and advise the people being arrested of their rights and follow them to the police precinct and bail them out. And if they didn't have enough money in their small bail fund, they had lawyers and law students on standby. No one had seen anyone stand up to the police in such a strong and intelligent way. And the ranks of the Panther grew. Well, the California state legislatures responded by changing the law. They said, when we meant that citizens can carry guns openly, we didn't mean some crazy black militants with leather coats in Oakland, California. And the Panthers responded by driving down to Sacramento and storming the legislature with their guns. And all of the power legis uh, powerful legislatures all of them older men, all of them white men, all of them powerful men, not only because they were legislatures, but because they were businessmen and lawyers, the usual suspects that are in politics, saw these Black Panthers coming in and responded as powerful men would. They ducked. <laughs> they climbed under their seats. They called for the police, and the Panthers gave this great statement where they talked about the constitutional right to bear arms and how unarmed people are subject to slavery at any given moment. And I'm watching this on my grandmother's TV, and I said, they're crazy. <laughs> they got these guns, they got these leather coats, they're crazy. And the reporter came on and said, the ultra-militant Black Panther Party, the police stopped their car, found more guns and communist literature in their trunk. And I looked at that and I said, they're crazy. They got leather coats, they have guns, they got communist literature in their trunk, they're crazy, they're crazy. I want to join that one. <laughs> they are really militant. And we rode out to the Panther office, which was in Brooklyn, and it was about a 90-minute subway ride, and I'm with two older guys, and we were going to what we thought were the secret headquarters of the Black Panther Party. It was a big secret to Panther Party, so we thought. And one of my friends said, you know, um, I was the youngest one, I was 15, so one leans over and says, man, you know, um, you know the Panthers ain't no joke, right, man? You know it's like the mafia, once you get in, you can't get out. I was like, can't get out? <laughs> but I couldn't be a punk in front of my boys. I went, I don't care. <laughs> Other friend leaned over and says, uh, you know they're gonna make you prove yourself. You're gonna have to kill a white dude to be a Panther. And I'm like, kill somebody? I'm in the choir. <laughs> But I couldn't be a punk in front of my boys. I said, I don't care. Other person leans over, he says, no, man, get it straight, get it straight. You don't have to kill a white dude. Oh my God, I was so grateful I had to kill nobody. Then he said, you have to kill a white cop. <laughs> and you gotta bring in his badge and his gun. So I walk into the Panther office, I'm spellbound because I wanna turn around, but by that time we had gotten off the subway and there's that sign that says Black Panther Party. And I walk in and there are the Panthers. These brothers and sisters with their leather coats, some had on army fatigue jackets, the Afro, some of the sisters had their African gay lays, and I sat in the back row, and the brother's in the front at a desk, and he's 
running the meeting and he's explaining. It's what we call a community education class or a political education class. And he's explaining the Panther 10 point program. And the points in the program are very simple. Um, we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our community. Number two is we want full employment for our people. Number three, we want a decent, uh, decent housing fit for shelter for human beings. And he gets down to point number five. And by the way, if you go online and you look up October 1966, you can read it and there's nothing in there about you can't get out, nothing about killing white people, bringing a cop's badge and gun. Am I hearing this? No, because I have a different conversation. I'm going to be a black militant. I'm a man. I'm approved. I'm not a punk. And I jump up as he's talking about point number five, which is about education. We want an education that teaches us our true history and the true nature of this decade in American society. And I jumped to my feet and I said, choose me, brother, or me. I'll kill a white dude right now. <laughs> the whole meeting stops. The Panther officer points to me. He said, come here, young brother. And I walk up and I'm standing next to the desk and he opens the bottom drawer of the desk and he reaches in and he reaches so far down in, he's fishing around for something. My heart is pounding and I'm thinking to myself, look how far down he's reaching in the desk. He's going to give me a big damn gun. <laughs> a few seconds later, he hands me the secret weapon of the Black Panther Party, the secret weapon of the liberation movement. He hands me a stack of books. Autobiography of Malcolm X. Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver, Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, the famous little red book, quotations from Chairman Mao. Now I'm thinking, you know, he gave me some books. That's not what they were talking about on the train. He gave me books. I ain't come here for books. If I wanted books, I wouldn't have played hooky today. So I figured it must be a test. So I said, um, excuse me, brother. I thought you were going to arm me. And he looked at me and he said, excuse me, young brother, I just did. And as I started back to my seat, he said, young brother, let me ask you a question since you came in here talking about you want to kill white folks. He said, if all of the pig police, you know the Panthers are very colorful, he said, if all of these racist pig police that are in the community brutalizing people, shooting them down, locking them up, if all of them were black and the people being brutalized were white, he said, all of these greedy, avaricious businessmen that are in the community that have these stores that are ripping people off with high prices, spoiled vegetables, rotten meat, if all of them were black and the people being ripped off were white. He said, these jive time, demagogous, fascist pig politicians, everybody who's in control, the congressmen, the judges, the senators, if all of them were black and the people being exploited and oppressed were white, would that make things correct? And this time I answered with my brain instead of my bruised ego, and I said, well, no, sir, I think that would still be wrong. And for the first time he smiled, he said, that's right, brother. This is a class struggle for human rights, not just a race struggle. Study those books so you know what this revolution is about. That was my first day. I came back the next day and he said, okay, now we have another assignment for you. I was like, okay, I'm getting my gun now. I read some of the books. And, um, and then he gave me the next secret weapon of the Black Panther Party. I closed my eyes and there was something in it and I looked to see my gun and it was a pancake spatula. <laughs> and I was sent to work in the Panther Free Breakfast Program. And I came to understand why the Panthers thought this was the next most important mission that one could do. You know, there were things in schools talking about that black children are not learning, um, that they're failing. And besides talking about the failure of what might be going on in the classroom, Panthers, many who had younger brothers and sisters, some had children, realized that you can't expect a kid in kindergarten or first grade to listen to a teacher explain that two apples plus three apples equal five apples and their stomach is growling. And so they reasoned that one of the most basic things that we could do if we're an organization that said that we love the people and we serve the people is to feed breakfast to our children. And with no money, with no grants, and with no permission, the Panthers organized a breakfast program. Panthers would go to community centers and church basements and ask could they use their facilities. They would go to storekeepers in the community and ask for donations of food. Please give us a case of eggs. The store around the corner is giving us a case of milk. 
the store two blocks away is giving us a, pace of, uh, a case of pancake mix. And you would get the donations, and then grandmothers would come help you cook. People from the community would come, and you'd put out a flyer, and children would come because there's no shortage of hungry children. And within a few days, you'd be feeding 25 kids, and that would become 50 kids, and then hundreds of kids. And you had a community program where you were organizing people around their needs. The health clinic. The Panther office would become a health clinic on the weekends. And you would talk to doctors and nurses, young doctors and nurses, who says, I want to do more, I want to give more. And we would say, come in on your day off. Give us a few hours a day. And they would come with their medical bags, and they'd take some extra medicine. And they'd begin treating people for hypertension and for asthma, two things that really run rampant in the community. Sickle cell testing at a time when people didn't really hear about it. Other things that people weren't being treated for because the first line of health care for people who are poor is the emergency room. And when you begin to organize people around your needs, you begin to understand that you are organizing people that you care about and that you love, that it's a very human conversation. The greatest thing that a revolutionary has is great feelings of love. And you begin to understand that when you talk about liberation and when you talk about freedom and you talk about revolution and people are struggling just to survive, these are abstract concepts. Freedom to someone who is starving, brothers and sisters, is a meal. Liberation to someone who is homeless is a dry, warm, safe place to sleep at night. And those were the community programs. And that's why when J. Edgar Hoover went before Congress just a few months after I joined the Black Panther Party and declared that the Panthers was the greatest threat to the internal security of America, the thing that bothered him the most was not the guns, it was the breakfast program. That was insurgent. That was treasonous. That was a threat because the Black Panther Party, along with the community, had figured out how to do something that the government refused to do, which is organize people around their basic needs. What an education. What an experience. I rose to the ranks and became a, uh, an officer in the Black Panther Party, head of the youth cadre. Within just a few months, I had a mentor named Yewa who taught me a lot of things. I mean, and, and, and I have to take a moment to talk about the women in the Black Panther Party. Uh, there, is, there were no more dynamic women than women in the Black Panther Party. And how I first encountered that was, uh, you know, after I had been in the Panthers, you know, for, for a couple of weeks and felt like I had my little swagger on, I had my official little leather coat that I went and got, and, you know, my little Panther afro, and a you know, a, a pretty sister who was maybe a year or two older than me walked by, and I said, what's happening, baby? And the sister spun on me, she said, the revolution is happening, my brother, and my name is not baby. <laughs> <laughs> so Fanny Shakur came and said, Jamal, Tupac's mom, she had first told me to go home because I was too young. She said, Jamal, Panther women do not want to hear all that nonsense. So if you want to get a Panther woman's attention, you say, power to the people, my sister. That's what the Panthers would say, all power to the people. And then we would break it down. We would say, that means black power for black people, white power for white people, brown power for brown people, red power for red people. And people would say, why did the Panthers say white power for white people? Well, we're talking about the people. We're not talking about the the power structure, the corporations, the politicians. We're talking the majority of people in this country, both black and white, who are struggling, who are working, and it was true then, it's true now, there are more white people on welfare at this moment than black folks. So we're talking about a system that exploits everyone, takes money for everyone, and then is able to pull the trick of making us, making us hate each other. Oh, there would be more jobs if it wasn't for those black folks. Oh, there would be more opportunities if it wasn't for the immigrants. You know the stories. It's what we still hear now. Everybody else is to blame except the system that continues to get wealthy as we get poorer. But anyway, Faini said, look, you got to say power to the people to a Panther woman. And then when she says power to the people, brother, how are you doing? Then you have to say something like, well, my sister, you know, I'm really tired. I was up at 5 o'clock in the morning at the Panther breakfast program. 
Then I was working at the health clinic. Then I went and organized a school and I sold papers. Then I came back to political education class. Then I was out on community patrol and it's midnight and I'm barely standing, sister, but I love the people. <laughs> And then the panther might say, well, brother, you're so tired, man. Why don't you come sit down for a second? Maybe we'll make you some dinner. That's what panther women want to hear. And the best compliment that you could get was that you were a good worker in the struggle. I, I want to put that in context because as the attacks began to happen on the Black Panther Party, and in particular what happened to the Panther 21, my mentor, Yewa, who taught me how to make pancakes, who taught me how when I finally did get weapons training, how to put together an M16 and take it apart, uh, it's the first chapter of the book where I opened the book, described how I'm blindfolded in the middle of the floor of a Panther safe house, taking a gun apart. And then um, coming to my grandmother's house when she found all this Panther literature hidden under my bed. I'm on the go. I'm too busy now. I'm a Panther. Between school and the breakfast program and Panther meetings and rallies, I'm on the go. Clean your room. I'm going to get to a grandma. Clean your room. I'm going to get to a grandma. So finally she did what a lot of us parents and grandparents did do. She went to straighten up my room. And lo and behold, she found my stash. Where most teenage boys might have that box that had Playboy magazines, I had something much worse. I had those Panther papers where cops looked like pigs carrying guns and school, African school children had like, you know, books in one hand and AK-47s in the other hand. You know those famous paintings by Emery Douglas? And I remember coming home from school that night and she had the table set up with my Panther papers in one stack, a holy Bible and a strap. It looked like a mafia altar. <laughs> I stopped in my tracks. I knew I was in trouble. Grandma said, boy, what is this? And I said, Grandma, you was in my room? That's all I could fall back on. I was so weak. <laughs> she said, boy, don't you even start. She said, what is this here? And I tried to explain, and she says, no. She says, I don't care what you say. You're not going back to that place. She says, boy, because right now, I don't know whether to bless you with this belt or murder you with this Bible. <laughs> And I went to the Panther office to explain that I could not go back because my grandmother was tripping and she was an Uncle Tom. And Afeni Shakur almost jumped in my chest and took my lungs out. She said, never talk about your grandmother like that. Never talk about her. She loves you and you have not been responsible and she is trying to protect you the best way you know how. And I remember my section leader volunteering to come up. That's what a sergeant or a lieutenant was, Yewa. And he comes to the house and he sits down and he, uh, he has on his panther jacket, but none of the buttons. And he has on a tie. I didn't even know we were allowed to wear ties. And he says, Mother Baltimore. Nuni's last name was Baltimore. He says, Mother Baltimore. And right away he gets some points because she's an elder in the church. She said, if you say Jamal, excuse me, I mean Eddie, if you say he can't come to the Panther office, ma'am, I'm going to respect that because you are his grandmother. You are my elder. If you tell me to do something right now, I have to do it. He said, but ma'am, I know he's giving you a hard time. And if you don't mind, even if he doesn't come back to the Panther office, I'm going to keep an eye on him if it's okay with you. And I'm off on the side going like, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, ma'am, if you want him in the house, by 9 o'clock, if that's his curfew, if he doesn't walk in the house by 8.45, I will take off this garrison belt buckle and I'll beat his butt. And I'm like, what are you doing? Not, you're supposed to come do the Panther magic. What are you? <laughs> he said, ma'am, he could be doing better in school. I know this. If you want him to bring you an 85 on the next algebra exam, if he doesn't bring you a 95, I will take these size 13 combat boots and I'll give him a swift kick in the butt. And by this time, I'm like, why did you even come? I'm grounded till I'm 75 now. <laughs> but Grandma thought about his word, and she said, well, my mind was pretty made up. She said, but you know it is hard raising a boy alone. So if you promise to keep an eye on him, make sure he's OK, make sure that he does what he's supposed to do around the house and school and obey my rules, I'll let him go back. And so I went back, thanks to Yewa. And four weeks later, a team of about 30 police officers kicked in grandma's door at 4 o'clock in the morning and put me in handcuffs and drug me off to prison. And I had just turned 16 and I was charged with a conspiracy case in the Panther 21 case and I was facing 360 plus years. And when we tried to find out what that case meant, we found out that there was undercover police officers in the Black Panther Party that were part of an elite unit known as the Bosch Unit, the Bureau of Special Services. 
And one of the members of the police unit was a guy named Gene Roberts, who was a security lieutenant. And Gene had been a member of the Nation of Islam and had left the Nation of Islam with Malcolm X and became a member of the Organization of African American Unity and was one of Malcolm's bodyguard and was on stage when Brother Malcolm got shot and gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and he was a cop at that time. Malcolm X drew his last breath from an undercover cop. But of course, with those credentials, he joined the Black Panther Party and he became a security lieutenant. And the other person who was an undercover cop was my mentor, Yewa, the person who taught me how to make pancakes, how to shoot a gun, and how to say hi to a panther woman, who talked to my grandmother. And that is how counterintelligence works. And that was part of the FBI's counterintelligence program that used infiltration, false evidence, lies, local police, as in the case of Fred Hampton, how the local police were manipulated and cooperated with the FBI to burst into Fred Hampton's home in Chicago and shoot Fred Hampton in his sleep. 21 years old, brilliant speaker, dynamic organizer, came from the NAACP, and Fred's biggest offense to the Chicago Police Department and to the city of Chicago was that Fred was turning gangs into progressive community organizations. He took the baddest, roughest, meanest, craziest gang, Latino gang in Chicago, the Young Lords, and turned them into the Young Lords Party. He politicized them. They put down their guns and picked up pancake spatulas, published a paper and created gang truces. He was doing the same thing with the Blackstone Rangers. But think about this. Think about 50,000 gang members being organized to be revolutionaries, to understand about class struggle, to understand who the real enemy is outnumbering the Chicago Police Department, and taking on the government as the real bullies and the real gangsters. And for that, Fred Hampton had to die, and Mark Clark had to die. What the Black Panther Party learned from something that happened in Chicago 13 years earlier, they left that apartment open. They told people to come down and look. And as people walked through the apartment and saw the bloody sheets and they saw the bullet holes, this fierce shootout, as it was reported by the Chicago police and in the news, young white reporters from the newspaper began to look at the bullet holes and said, if this was such a fierce shootout, how come all of the bullet holes were coming from outside of the apartment, inside the apartment? And you don't have to be a forensics ex expert to understand that a bullet hole goes in small and comes out wide. And all across the country, Panther officers were attacked. In New York, it was the Panther 21 case. In Chicago, it was the murder of Fred Hampton. In Des Moines, Iowa, a Panther office gets bombed. In Philadelphia, a Panther office gets raided, and Panthers are made to stay naked on the street in the middle of the night for five hours. In Los Angeles, they attack, and there's an 18-hour shootout. All across the country, Panthers are being killed. And the biggest offense was, according to J. Edgar Hoover, the breakfast program, and the fact that the Panthers were giving books to kids and that they were teaching people who were ex-convicts and who were illiterate how to read and how to articulate what was really happening to them under the system of inequality. The Panther 21 was eventually acquitted after being in prison for years, after bails that were in excess of collectively, you know, $5 million, $100,000 each. That's a lot of money today. Imagine what that ransom was like in 1969. My journey continued. I became a young uh, spokesman, one of the, uh, the youngest national spokesmen. I went back to prison for hiding out people who were on the run for the FBI. And in prison, not far from here in Leavenworth Penitentiary, is when I learned how to be a playwright, is where I earned a degree from the University of Kansas and where I learned the power of the creative arts for social change. I got to the prison and I, an old timer who was there gave me some amazing advice. He said, young blood, you can serve this time or you can let this here time serve you. And with that, I was able to take advantage and read as much as I could. It comes back to that book. It comes back to the books that we weren't allowed to read. It comes back to those things that Frederick Douglass talked about and that all of our leaders talked about and that happened in the Panther office. We consumed books. We had literacy classes. And then some people came up to me and said, yo, blood, you did plays out there? 
And it was a group of guys surrounded me, and I was scared to say yes. I thought I was going to get beat up. I said, yeah? And they said, yeah, we thought so. Why don't you do something for Black History Month? We done worked it out with the warden. We got a little space. So I went to the prison library, and it was only one play. It was um, A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. And I read the play, and I was really moved by it, and I got choked up, and I came. And it was not just because it was the play. It was, you know, they expected me to do a play, and it was all women, mainly characters. In the play, I said, I came back, and I said, this is a play about a black matriarch. There are many women in this play. I can't do a play. And Mr. Cody's response was, don't worry about that, young blood. Just look out on the yard, pick out three or four guys. We'll put a dress on them. <laughs> I said no, and I went and I wrote a play. And, uh, and then I was, uh, and then uh, as I was doing the play, uh, rehearsing with the guys who were the black prisoners, uh, some guys from the Latino part of the yard, you know, prisoners are segregated because prisoners segregate themselves, came and uh, they, 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 they came to rehearsal, two or three guys, and these guys were doing life, and these guys had been convicted of murder since they were in prison because they settled everything with a knife. And they never left their yard unless they were going to go to war with someone. And they sat, and they're watching the rehearsal, and I'm looking at the corner of the eye, and they look upset like they're getting madder and madder. And finally, one guy, he, go, he comes up to me, and he says, yo, um, he says, yo, Essay, let me talk to you a second. And I go to the side, and I said, yeah. He said, yo, Essay, you know, um, there's no secrets here in the joint homes. And we heard we were doing a play. And I've been sitting here for about 10 minutes, and I'm real upset about something, and I want you to listen to me good. That guy you're working with, I say, that black guy over there, your essay, he's not feeling his character. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, man, why don't you come get involved? So we wrote the play. They got involved. Some of the white guys came because they thought that it was a conspiracy to box them out. We wrote them into the play, and we became our own multicultural uh, portion of the yard. And that's when I started to realize the power of the creative arts and social change. And when I came out, that's the work uh, that Assistant Dorsey said that I was able to do with the young people of Impact Repertory Theater um, uh, in Harlem at Columbia University, uh, serving, as she mentioned, as an assistant professor, uh, chair of the department, associate professor, and most recently a full professor at Columbia University. I'd like to leave you with this thought. A lot of people said, why uh, did you write the book? And I wrote the book because as I give talks across the country, young people, young students, high school students and college students, brilliant graduate students um, would come to me and they would say, what was it like? And it would be with that kind of passion. And I understood as someone who had been a dramatist, who had written plays and uh, who had written screenplays, that they meant, what did it feel like? You know how a good film really takes you there, makes you part of the experience. Not an intellectual looking back of a professor in his 50s, looking back to the 60s, but how did it feel as a 15-year-old trying to, stepping into the Panther office, trying to figure out manhood and trying to figure out life? There's a call to action for us now because things have not gotten better, they've gotten worse. The divide has gotten larger. And there is this tremendous thing that we have to deal with in terms of especially our black and brown young men who are going to prison at alarming rates. When I was in prison, and I've been home for about 26 years, the United States of America was number three in the number of people that it had incarcerated, third behind the Soviet Union and South Africa, with about a half million people in prison. Now, the United States is number one with two million plus in prison. I need you to understand these figures. We are 13% of the population. I'm talking about young African American men. We are 13% of the population, but we are 41% of the prison population. No matter where you go, no matter what the demographics are in that state, are in that federal county, that's who's there. When you have statistics that say one in eight young black men might graduate from high school and go to college, but one in three is guaranteed to be in the criminal justice system, we have work to do. When you have a situation where just this summer, where you have Ramali Williams murdered in the Bronx where police follow him home, where you have Trayvon Martin dead, where you have the young man in Arkansas who was handcuffed, searched twice and still managed to shoot himself to the head, we have work to do. 
When you have agencies that do studies, statistics to test third and fourth grade reading scores to determine not how many schools to build, but how many prisons to build, we have work to do. And I say that we have to stand united, that we have to use the books, that somehow we have to build roadblocks to jail and pathways to Yale. We have work to do. And it is the book. It is the community. It is the love. It is the power of the people. And it is understanding that the greatest gift of a revolutionary, although it sounds ridiculous, are the great undying feelings of love, brothers and sisters, of love.